It has been mentioned already, but allow me to add my welcome to each one of you. We're thankful that we can be together. It's a beautiful morning outside, and you make it a beautiful morning here on the inside. To those watching online, those listening by conference call, we're happy that you are with us as well. We have a lot of families hurting this morning, and uh, we want to be mindful of them as we have been already in prayer. Yesterday, we uh, paid a formal, not goodbye, but just to see you later to our brother Roy Brown, and certainly we remember Miss Wilma and all of their family as they continue to grieve. Tomorrow, we'll say our see you later to our brother S.C. Maynard, and we remember our uh, sister Betty and all of his family. And uh, times like this, uh, we need each other. And I know so many of you are good to love and support and encourage. And I just ask you to continue to do that. If by chance you're visiting and want to know what we're about, maybe in times uh, when we have sorrow and difficulty, you can see most clearly uh, the need uh, that we have for one another. That's why God has, I believe, created uh, us for community and for family. And thankfully, through His Son Jesus, He allows us to be a part of His family, spiritual family, the church. That's what we want you to be a part of in this place. So if we can help you in that way, uh, that's what we certainly desire to do more than anything else. Please uh, let us share that good news with you. Uh, this month, we want to continue. This for uh, the last few weeks has been the focus of our study, one that might seem a little bit head-scratching, perhaps if you're visiting. What do you mean the devil? You're talking about the devil? Yeah, we're talking about the devil. How do we deal with the devil? Now, we're not giving any information about him so as to engender any sort of admiration for the devil. I hope you don't leave this morning saying, well, I like him more than I did before. In fact, I hope you have exactly the opposite reaction. I want you to know that he is our enemy. And while we talked about last month something of his origin, we did some you know, really intense kind of philosophical investigation about God, our Creator, who is good. And if He's created everything, then what does that mean about the devil and the existence of evil and suffering in this world and calamity? I know I didn't answer all of your questions about that, and certainly today people still, as they watch the news or as they have um, problems come into their life, as they face adversity, they sometimes cry out, where is God? God is good. And God is available. And God has, as we've talked about already in prayer, made Himself known. And His Word provides us that information. And His love is unquestionable. Now, I know that's hard sometimes in those dark days, in those times of suffering. But please know that that's true. This month, I want us to look at what the devil, our enemy, the evil one does. Irregardless of what he looks like, where he came from, or anything like that. All of those kind of details are really unimportant. I want us to look at four ideas, and they're all uh, with letter D's. If you like that, this is just for my memory purposes. Uh, this morning, I want to tell you something about the devil because he is one determined to distract. Determined to distract. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm going to hopefully show you with the aid of God's Word how he attempts to do that. I believe it's one of his most effective ways of convincing people not to serve God. In weeks ahead, next week and following, we'll look at how this evil enemy is devoted uh, to deception. Uh, the work that he does is very deceptive, and he engages in it frequently. He is driven to dilute or to division. I kind of struggled which word to use, but uh, both of those words will apply. And then finally, we're going to look at his end. He is one that is certainly destined to destruction. We want to avoid having any share in that destruction that he will face. Let me begin by taking you to Luke 4, chapter, or Luke chapter 4, verse 13. In that opening uh, chapter, as Luke describes uh, the ministry of Jesus, our Savior, the Son of God in flesh, comes to earth. And we know already from what Luke has told us, He doesn't arrive with great fanfare. He doesn't arrive uh, even with the notice of anyone other than some shepherds looking out for their flocks, interrupted in the middle of the night by an angelic throng, praising God and saying, go to, Jer uh, go to Bethlehem, not to Jerusalem, the capital city, not to where the seat of government is, not to where all of the important people are and the celebrities, but go to the lowly village of Bethlehem. And there you'll find Joseph and Mary 
And more than that, you'll find Jesus, the baby, born to be the Savior, born as the Holy One of God. And they go and they make that great discovery. Luke continues to tell us events of the early days of the birth and life of Jesus. And we talked about those last December when most of the world's focused on that. But now Luke tells us that Jesus, God's Son, begins His ministry. And as He begins it, He begins it with a test. A very severe test, in fact, because the Bible says for 40 days in the wilderness, He was tempted by the devil. Now, again, if you're like me, my curiosity really wants to know what that looked like. We can imagine, uh, we've got a lot of pictures, although none of them probably um, all that accurate, but we have an idea of what Jesus as a Middle Eastern Israeli man of the first century might have looked like, but what did the devil look like? And how did they converse? And, uh, you know, just all of those details, I'll leave that to your imagination. But the devil poses at least three temptations. I believe there's certainly more, but these might have been just representative of all of them. And Jesus, on each occasion, to the devil's attempt to tempt him, said, No devil, it's written. That is, in response to what you want me to do, let me tell you instead what God, my heavenly Father, has said we should do. It is written, and he uses God's word, Scripture as His guide. All of that's important. We could look at those temptations, and we might a little bit more in the weeks that are ahead. But I want to look at how Luke tells us that encounter uh, ends. In verse 13, it says, When the devil had ended every temptation, he had tried, at least it seems, all that he could try in order to make Jesus our Savior fall, to solicit Him to disobey the will of God. And all of those proved unsuccessful. The Bible says the devil departed from him, from Jesus. But notice, please, that next phrase, until an opportune time. Until an opportune time. Your Bible might say something to, until another season. Here's the first point. If you take nothing else from the lesson this morning, take this. And it is that the devil is relentless. The devil is an enemy of you and of me and of every person who lives on this planet. And he is relentless in his attacks. And what I mean by that is it doesn't necessarily imply that he is constantly attacking you. But what it does mean is that he never takes no for an answer. Some people today just dismiss this whole idea of the devil and of evil and say, you know, preacher, I'm not really sure any of that actually exists. Maybe it's just a figment of your imagination. Maybe it's just an improper psychological response to uh, something that you have perceived from some experience that you've had. And many would take and adopt such a mentality. But the Bible will not allow such a conclusion because here even the Son of God Himself, Jesus, faced off with the devil. And you will too. And even though you may resist him, as Jesus did, the devil won't throw up his hands and quit and say, Well, I tried. I guess I'll go into someone else. You may very well this morning be, at this very moment, confident. And I hope that you are. We think of this place as a safe place, if you will. But that's not to say he cannot tempt us here. Most likely, maybe he already has. Even in the time that we've been together. If not right now, maybe before you got here. Has the devil tempted you already today? He has me. I won't give you all the details how or why, but there have been several points already. I don't imagine that the rest of this day I'll be free from temptation, and likely you will not be either. The devil is relentless in his temptation. He will not take no for an answer. So that brings us maybe to this question. When we think of temptation, do we think of it actively or passively? And uh, many times I think we're tending, we tend to focus on the active part of temptation. That is, the devil just comes right out and says, here's what you need to do, or let me tempt you in doing this, which is clearly a violation of the will of God. And oftentimes, even that in-your-face sort of temptation is something that we struggle to resist. You remember in Genesis 39 and verse 7, this is the account of a young man named Joseph. He was sold into uh, slavery in Egypt by his brothers who lived in the land that God gave to his father and great-grandfather Abraham. And here Joseph had angered his brothers, if you know the backstory, And so they think they'll get rid of him. And he's sold into Egypt. They take his coat of many colors back to dad and say, Look, it's covered in blood. And dad makes the conclusion an animal probably just tore him to pieces. 
And so they think we've solved the Joseph problem. And the story shifts now. Joseph is in Egypt, far away from home. And from all those that he loved, he's in the house of the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard, the head of the secret service, if you will, in Egypt. And he excels in all of the work that he's given to do as a slave. And here, this man Potiphar that he serves is so confident in his abilities, he said, you do whatever you want to do. I have that much trust and confidence in you. Uh, but then an antagonist is introduced into the story, Mrs. Potiphar. We don't even know her name. But she, looking at Joseph as a young man, makes advances toward him. And in fact, they're just straight out right in his face when she says, and again, the Bible doesn't pull any punches, when we hear her say to Joseph, lie with me. And it wasn't talking about telling a dishonest statement or making a dishonest statement. That word lie means something entirely different. And we understand what her intent was. Right in his face, lie with me. Now, I imagine, I'm just guessing, and I don't want to take you far, too far down this road. I don't imagine that she made that statement haphazardly or even with any lack of confidence. I'm sure that she probably did everything she could to make herself very alluring and provocative in that statement. And the Bible even says that she had done so repeatedly. But Joseph said, not going to do it. I cannot sin against my God. I cannot sin against your husband, my master. Not going to do it. But the temptation was just right there in front of him. That's active temptation. And sometimes the devil might do that to you and me. He might put a temptation before us and say, here's what you want to do, is it not? Here's something that would be fun to do, pleasurable to do. Oh yes, God may have said otherwise, but why don't you do this? An act of temptation. But there is another type of temptation, and that's the one we're going to think about this morning, uh, that I believe it's kind of more passive in nature. That is, we may not be realizing that in a very subtle way, and Genesis 3 tells us about a serpent, probably at the devil's behest or being utilized by the serpent in the Garden of Eden, was a subtle creature. He was cunning. And we sometimes even use language like this, the phrase, an idle mind is the devil's playground or workshop. I've heard it said in a variety of ways through the years. And sometimes people are forgetful of the fact that even in the times when we may not see the temptation clearly in front of us for what it is, the devil may be cunning and in a very subtle way working, trying to tempt us without even maybe our recognition of it. That's why it's so important what we think, and to be careful what we think. And the Bible pays great emphasis on that, our thought life, as it's sometimes called. That's so important because even if it's not active temptation, it could be passive temptation. I don't know about you, but I've had a number of experiences uh, like that through the years. Uh, sometimes uh, there are things that uh, are just kind of almost uh, humorous to think about. Uh, I remember uh, when I first started enjoying running uh, in uh, my attempt to get in better shape, uh, uh, there was a good sweet sister that lived around the road. And because uh, we lived out in the country, there was no traffic, so I'd try to run about uh, the time the sun came up. Uh, that was before uh, the boys were usually up and we had responsibilities with them. So I just enjoy running along, you know, watching the sun rise and thinking I was getting in good shape. But uh, like a lot of good country folks uh, did, uh, brother and sister Pippin got up at the crack of dawn to start their farm chores and she'd be cooking breakfast and country ham. The smell of that would be wafting through the air and I'd be jogging. And I'd find myself, you know, just almost jogging into their driveway to see if I could uh, get some. I'd say, no, I can't do that. Got to stay on track here. And uh, I kind of switched and said, well, I'll try it in the afternoon. Well, she made the best chocolate pies along with Sister Sarah back there. So I'd smell chocolate pies as I run by. You know, you just kind of fear, feel yourself veering into uh, the driveway to get some chocolate pie. And she would have gladly shared either and both with me. Uh, kind of a passive, a subtle thing. The devil does that to you and me every day. And we'll see that momentarily uh, in some of the ways in which he tries to distract us. But let me show you how Jesus understood that. Amazingly, Jesus makes three statements. They're all found in the Gospel of John as he nears the cross. Telling us something about the devil and he gives him a description. And in each of these lessons, I'm going to try to describe or try to highlight some of these names that the devil wears. Now we know he wears the name devil. Devil means one that slanders. Last week we talked about Satan. That's a word that just means he's an opponent, he's an accuser, he's an adversary. But there are some other ways in which the devil is described. 
Amazingly, in John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus talking about His impending death, He said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Now there's a lot here that we don't have time this morning to really explore. But this is what Jesus said about this evil being that we do battle with even today. He said He's the ruler of this world. In John chapter 14, just a few pages over in verse 30, Jesus tells these, his closest followers, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me. The ruler of this world. Was he talking about Herod, the Jewish procurator or Jewish figurehead in Jerusalem? No. Was he talking about Pontius Pilate, the governor appointed by Rome uh, to govern The Judean province? No. Was he talking about Augustus Caesar who had his throne in Rome that he was going to come and pay Jesus a visit? No. He's talking about the devil. The ruler of this world is coming. And then in chapter 16 and verse 11, Jesus says very bluntly about his death and the effects of it. He said, the ruler of this world is judged. Now, there's a lot in all three of these passages that, again, I wish we had time to really dig into and Uh, kind of study with greater uh, detail, but that's not the purpose of this illustration. Instead, Jesus said, we have an enemy. He had an enemy. And that enemy was going, he thought, to succeed and be victorious as Jesus went to the cross. But what the devil didn't know is that even in that terrible act, even when he aided men in some way, he didn't force them, they reached the conclusion on their own, But as they rejected the Son of God, as they reject Jesus our Savior and nail Him to a cross, the devil might have been smiling, thinking the victory was his. But all that the death of Jesus did was make salvation possible for me and you. It made my forgiveness a reality when He shed His blood and when His tomb was empty on the third day. Victory was the Lord's. He triumphed over that enemy, the devil. But He said, the ruler of this world. Now that's very... Ironic. We mentioned Luke chapter 4. If you go to Matthew chapter 4, that temptation that I mentioned a moment ago, Matthew records the same, just from a little bit of a different perspective. But again, it's the devil. And it's Jesus. And the devil uh, says, you know, Jesus, you're hungry. Forty days without food. Why don't you make this stone into bread? Do you think you have the power to do that? If you're the Son of God, surely you did. Surely you could. But Jesus said, no, it's written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what God said to do. Well, how about jumping off the temple, Jesus? Just go ahead and do that. And this time, Matthew chapter 4, verse number 6 says, The devil himself quotes scripture. Mentioning what God's word had said in Psalm 91 and verse 12, Just jump off and the angels will swoop in and catch you before you hit the bottom, in essence. Jesus said, but let me tell you also what is written. You should not tempt the Lord your God. Well, finally, the devil says, well, Jesus, what about this? Taking him up somehow, do they fly? Do they, you know, just kind of appear in one place or another? Again, use your imagination as you will. But the scene is Jesus and the devil looking over the vista of the entire world, an exceedingly high mountain in every kingdom of the world, whether that meant presently at that moment in history or maybe even down through the ages of history to the present hour. I can't say with certainty, but here it is, Jesus. Everything is yours. If, says the devil, if you will bow down, fall down, and worship me. Now, why would he why would he couch it in those terms? Why would he make the solicitation in that way? Presumably, it seems, Jesus called him the ruler of this world. Jesus called him that three times in John's gospel, as I showed you in the previous slides. Could it be that the devil is saying, Here is what I have some measure of control over? Not equal to the control of God, not omnipotent and all-powerful. We know the devil is not. But somehow, with the permissiveness of God, the devil does hold some sway over the world. And maybe even does to the present. I don't know with certainty. But isn't it ironic? All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. 
And now Jesus in John's gospel says he's going to be judged. He has nothing in me. He's going to be destroyed. And now Jesus has done that. And he can no longer, that is the devil, offer you or me by way of temptation the world. He tries to do that sometimes by tempting us in so many different ways. But it belongs to Jesus because Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the victor. And we rejoice in that this morning. Now, this idea of the devil's control or sway over our world is mentioned by Paul. In Ephesians 2 and verse 2, he mentions that some walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, you may scratch your head and say, that's, that's weird. I don't really understand that. Not sure I do either. But Paul said, those who follow the course of the world, they're serving someone other than the true God of heaven. Chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul said, we don't wrestle... That is, fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the military term, against flesh and blood. That's not what we do. But instead, we do face principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, what these are, sinister forces and wicked and evil enemies, I don't claim to know with complete certainty. Some of you that have studied it more than me, feel free to share with me what you think they might be. But Paul said we have some enemies for sure. Some bad, evil forces that we must contend with. And sometimes just watching the world and the events that unfold, I'm left shrugging my shoulders saying, what is that? Why could an individual, why could a man, why could a government, why could individuals commit such heinous acts of brutality against their fellow man? I don't know all of the reasons why such evil, why such wickedness and immorality and, uh, you know, criminal and barbaric behavior happens. But maybe this verse is part of the explanation. All of these spiritual forces of wickedness. So that's why Paul said, as a Christian, you better take the armor of God. You better prepare yourself spiritually for this battle that you're engaged in. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, those in our Wednesday night class know we've already covered this. But Paul says there is a God of this age, if you will. And that word age can also be translated world, or it can also mean time or place. There's a God now, little g God, please see that, a little g God that for so many he blinds their mind. They don't believe the gospel of the glory of Christ. The illumination that we can enjoy and that we talked about a moment ago in prayer that God's word gives us to understand what life's about. So many people, they just don't get that. People that I love and people that you love, people that live next to you and work with you and that play ball with you and that, uh, you know, do all of those other things. They look at what we're doing even at this hour and they just, uh, they're befuddled. And we look at them and we're uh, confused saying, why don't you get it? Why can't you see what life is really about? Why can't you see the importance of serving God, living for Jesus? Why can't you see that? And they ask in response, why do you do all of those things? I don't understand that evil either. Why? Here's the reason why, and here's the point of this lesson this morning. Because the devil is determined to distract. And not only is he determined to distract with many, he has already succeeded in doing the so. Jesus gave us this simple gardening analogy. It's about that time when you'll start working in your garden or flower bed. Some may have already done uh, some of that early this spring. That will continue and whether you're a master gardener or just uh, one person that puts maybe a little uh, pot of flowers on the front porch, we understand this easy, simply uh, put illustration that Jesus makes that if you take seed of whatever type or kind and you throw them in a place where there are thorns and briars and other weeds, what's going to happen? Well, they may sprout. That flower or that vegetable may grow for a little while, but if the competing weeds and briars and thorns are not removed eventually just what jesus said that particular flower or vegetable it's not going to produce it's going to be unfruitful well, jesus are you trying to give us some clue as to how to better uh, manage our garden and horticultural enterprise no jesus isn't concerned with that he said the seed is the word of god in this parable and for so many people in this life when they hear the word of god they do take it in but unfortunately, into their life, instead of just taking the Word of God and having it in a good heart and mind, with that good heart and mind, sadly, is the 
is the clutter, is the pollution, is all of the other distractions. Here Jesus says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, they choke God's word and it becomes unfruitful. Do we live in a time of distraction today? Do we live in a time when distraction is really a problem? I think to ask that question is to answer it. Do these little icons mean anything to you? Do they help you have an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about distraction? You know, distraction can be deadly. You think about just all through the years, events that have transpired and some investigation is done and it is revealed or is, is discovered somehow uh, that, you know, there was a distraction. There was something that, you know, caused the person, instead of attending to the task that was most important, to look to something else. I don't remember the exact number of times. I know it was multiple times, unfortunately, during my career in the funeral industry, that there would be a tragic automobile accident. And uh, more than once, more than twice, and I suppose maybe even, uh, maybe more than a dozen times, contributing to that. Contributing to that, those crash investigators were able to determine through cell phone records or maybe through the passengers that survived, instead of driving, the driver was distracted. Maybe they dropped something and they took their eyes off the road. Maybe they were trying to text or do something else. And it had deadly consequences. Now, we can see, we can all admit, oh, I don't want to be guilty of that. And we certainly should not want any desire to do that. But think about the distractions in our lives today just in these areas and what these little images and icons represent. And let me tell you that the devil is using all of this and otherwise to help you be distracted. And here in Romans chapter five, or Romans chapter eight, rather, beginning in verse five, I think is the key point that I want you to take from this lesson this morning and ask yourself the question, what am I living according to? What am I living according, what do you say, living according to? If you'll read it with me in Romans chapter 8, listen to Paul's questioning. Or really, it's not so much a questioning, it's just a, uh, certainly a direct statement. We have to ask ourselves in response the question, which or what am I living according to? In verse 5, beginning, Paul said, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What do you live according to, the flesh or spirit? Well, you might say you need to define your terms. What do you mean live according to the flesh? Am I not a physical being? Well, surely you are. And I am too. I mean, just look down. You can hear me. You're hearing with the physical faculty that God gives you. You can touch. Uh, you can smell. Uh, all of those things that are going on simultaneously right now, you're in the flesh. And if you think about that, that may cause you to have some degree of perplexity then in verse 8 when Paul says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You might say, well, wait a minute, I'm in the flesh and I look around and it looks like you are too. I don't see you as a ghost or an apparition or whatever you want to call it like that. But what do you mean, Paul? Well, clearly Paul is not talking about our flesh just simply as the physical composition of what we're made up of. The skin and the bones and the blood vessels and all of the things that make us physical beings. He's talking about something more than that. He's talking about the physical part of our lives. That is that we are just interested in satisfying these parts of our physical life to the exclusion of those things which are spiritual. And what we often forget and what the devil has succeeded in convincing so many people of is that they are only physical beings. I think that might be at the real harder root of the problem. It has been, of course, for more than now, um, 150 years, close to 200 years, uh, that uh, the idea has been espoused. Darwin didn't start it. 
uh, if you know Charles Darwin's work. But of course, his efforts have certainly popularized and many have built on it in the decades since the publication of The Origin of Species that, uh, you know, everything in this universe that is here, including me and you, are just the result of physical processes. That we are not made in the image of God. We are only higher evolved life forms having ancestors of lower complex life forms. And that's the little image, of course, of the little tadpole swimming in the sea that grew legs that jumped out on the, uh, you know, the beach and then eventually grew arms and legs and turned into a monkey. And then, lo and behold, it given enough time and years, here I am. Here you are. And that's the idea. And some people said, well, you know, that, that doesn't really do any harm to people if that's what they want to believe as far as science. You know, uh, let them believe what they want to believe. It does great harm because it denies the truth of what God's Word says in Genesis chapter 1, that God spoke everything into existence and He created you and said, you're made in His image. You're special. He breathed into your nostrils and mine the breath of life and I became a living soul. And here Paul is making uh, us examine and question, what do you live according to this morning? Now, he's not saying we ignore our flesh. If I were to make some sort of silly pronouncement like, I'm going to show you folks how spiritual I am, I'm not even going to spend any time uh, eating today. And I, I'm going to show you I'm so spiritual, I'm, I'm not going to spend any time eating tomorrow. I'm going to use that time in uh, the examination and study of God's Word. I'm going to show you how spiritual I am. I'm not going to eat for the next week. Guess what? I won't be here next Sunday uh, to share anything with you. I'll already have returned to the dust out of which I was made because this dust, my body, has to have nourishment. Paul's not saying ignore the physical. But he says, where do you, notice verse 5, set your mind? What do you live according to? The spirit of the flesh. The devil has convinced millions of people that there is no soul within them, that there is nothing that is there because they can't see it. It's empirically uh, unverifiable. Uh, they say, you know, it's not really real. I made the mistake. I'll just admit my own folly here. Uh, back when I was doing a lot of research in this area, uh, it said, this is just something of interest, that when an individual dies, when biological, clinical death occurs, that there is a small, very, very small amount of measurable weight loss. That's what's said. And I didn't understand that. And uh, even I joined and some people said, well, that must be the soul or the spirit departing from the body, according to James 2.26. Folks, that's not it. The soul of the spirit is not physically measurable. But that doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't mean it's not there. Here Paul says... If you're carnally minded, if you set your mind on only the physical, if you're only thinking about what satisfies you in your physical life, that's death. It has no hope, no end toward life. Spiritually minded people are life and peace. You cannot be subject to the law of God if you're only interested in serving your own physical desires, lust, and pleasures. And the devil has distracted millions upon millions of people all through the ages that that's all that life is about. Getting the mo most stuff, having the most fun. That's what most people live for. Eliminating pain at every uh, turn and trying just to live for how I can have fun and get stuff and enjoy life with no thought of eternity, with no thought of the spiritual, with no thought of living according to the ways of God. And that mindset is so very, very dangerous because it's a distracted one that so many people don't even realize. Now, please notice in verse 7 it says, it, that is the carnal mind, the physical person that only concerns themselves with this temporary life, cannot be subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. There are those, and even in the name of religion, who say, see, we're totally deprived, depraved, we're wicked, we're immoral, we'll, we're sinful. That's not what that verse is about in the least. It's not the idea that we have some inability to respond to God. It's rather about our unwillingness to submit to God because our focus or purpose and perspective is only on satisfying the flesh. The devil wants to distract and have you focus on these desires. Let me tell you this in truth as we wrap the lesson up. It's never been easier to cultivate a spiritual mindset, but it has never been easier to be distracted and tempted to live only for the flesh or for the physical side of life. I believe that. And I know you might say, well, 
times have always been tough and it's always been hard to be a follower of Jesus. I know it is. Read the New Testament and that's clear. But I do think we live in somewhat of a unique time and it's only intensifying. It has in my life. I've seen it intensify in the lives of my boys and it'll probably go on if we're here another hundred years. Most, very few, if any of us will. But it's never been easier. If you want to cultivate a spiritual mindset, there are resources, there are uh, abundance of Bibles and uh, certainly spiritual tools at your disposal. You can use the internet, you can use so many things. And you can do and have access to wonderful things that will help you grow and develop a spiritual mindset. But at the same time, there's never been a time, at least that I know of, when it's been easier to be distracted. I mentioned that idea of fasting. The Bible talks about fasting, voluntarily not eating. Choosing not to eat and instead give that time to some physical, or to give it rather to some spiritual pursuit. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you fast. And there is some value to doing that. We'll talk about that in our study uh, in Mark a, a little bit later, probably this month. But why would he say that? Why would the Bible indicate that that exercise was so important? Well, one of the reasons why I think is that in years gone by, the most pressing matter of every single day was getting enough food to eat. And a few of you probably, maybe because of the, uh, the hardships of your early childhood, coming out of the years of depression, even that this country faced, uh, that was a very, very much a pressing concern. But for most of us, and probably not just most, we'll just say for all of us this, this day, that's not really a pressing concern. Oh yeah, we're hungry. I'm ready to eat lunch right now, preacher. Hurry up, get done. But you're not worried about where your food's going to come from. You're not worried about if there's going to be enough. It may not be what you like. You might prefer something else. Somebody picks this restaurant and you want to go to that one. But there's no concern. But Jesus gave that instruction. That instruction is found in God's Word. So as even the pursuit of food sometimes should be put secondary to our pursuit of God. That's the idea of fasting and avoiding the distraction only to focus on the physical to the exclusion of the spiritual. How do you defeat the devil's distractions? Let me give you three simple ideas. There are not any that you've not heard before. All beginning with the letter S, so maybe you can remember them. Set. Colossians 3. Paul said, those who set their mind on the flesh, just this physical, that's death. Colossians chapter 3. Paul said, if you've been risen with, raised with Christ, a reference to obeying the gospel becoming a Christian, uh, to being buried with Him in baptism, to have your sins forgiven. You've been raised with Christ, so seek the things that are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't spend all of your time looking around. Don't spend all of your time worried about your bank account and what's in it. Don't worry about advancing at work or climbing the corporate ladder. Don't worry about uh, what you look like on your social media profile. Don't let all of those things and these things of this life that are temporary take your mind and focus off the spiritual, the eternal. Set your mind on heavenly things. Set your mind on things that will last and will endure. How do you do that? John chapter 5, you have to study Jesus encountered people in his day that supposedly knew God's word better than any people who had ever lived before. And they would gladly tell you that. But Jesus said, you won't accept me. You look in the word of God, you think you have life, but they are the very words that testify of me. And uh, so many people today, whether it's investigation of God's word or some human philosophy, uh, they think they can know without study, without uh, taking God's Word and daily focusing and reading and studying and trying to understand it better. You just can't do it. The devil will distract you. He'll try to keep you from this book. But if you take this book, you can keep away from him. But those are your only two options. You can't remain neutral in the matter. So please, take God's Word. Set your mind on things above. Study God's Word and supplicate. Just a fancy word for praying. But there's more to it in Hebrews 5 verse 7, talking about Jesus. It says, Jesus, with loud cries and supplications, made his appeal to God. The word is actually there, one that said uh, he would come as it were, extending an olive branch, trying to make peace with God on our behalf. And what I do when I supplicate, when I pray, is that I'm admitting where I should be, and so must you be, when I'm praying, I'm not informing God of anything He doesn't know. 
I'm not telling God, hey God, you know, I'm down here and you've not taken care of me. You need to give better attention. You need to do something more or different than what you're doing. That's not the purpose of prayer. Prayer is supplicating to God to say, God, I, I know you're there. I know you love me. I know you care for me. I know you want to help me. And I'm here to tell you, I need that. I want that. Please bless me and help me with that. That's what supplication in prayer is. I know the devil is trying to distract me. I know he's trying to get me to focus too much on me or mine and my stuff. But I'm instead looking to God and begging him to keep my focus where it should be. I'm studying his word so that I can see what he's done all throughout history. And even this book tells me what he'll do for all eternity. What else could you want to know or study more than to have that information? And it's here at your fingertips. And I'm begging God for the help that I know that he alone can give me to overcome the distractions the devil puts in my path. Has the devil defeated you by distraction this morning? So many are, again, whether actively or passively, tempted by the devil every day. He's determined to distract you. He's relentless. He's not going to take no for an answer. You may have said, well, I told him no yesterday. He'll show back up today. If he's not already, he'll show back up again tomorrow and he'll keep tempting you. He'll keep trying to distract you, but keep your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 says we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The idea surrounded by these cloud of witnesses, I used my running analogy a little bit earlier. Uh, that's something that I, in my mind, at least helps me that if you will, I know the finish line's in sight and it is for all of us. We don't know exactly how many miles are left, how many days or years God will yet give us, but there's a finish line out there. It's my death or the return of Jesus, whichever comes first, only He knows. But I want to keep running and stay focused. I know Jesus is waiting for me at the finish line. We've celebrated a lot of our folks lately. They finished. They finished. Embraced in the arms of Jesus. Their race is over. But they stayed focused to the end, and their faithfulness encourages us to do the same, just as the Hebrew writer said. This morning, are you distracted? Really evaluate that. Because it's easy to say, no, I'm not distracted. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm focused in, really. You must make that critical evaluation. Be very, very, very uh, determined to know yourself, whether you're distracted or not. If you're not a Christian, you may be pursuing a number of things. You may be succeeding in many areas of life. By the world's definition of success, uh, you may have uh, so many things in your favor, but uh, the devil has succeeded in distracting you from what is most important. That is that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus is the only one who can save. That message is the gospel. Hear and understand that wonderful message this morning. And if you do, then believe it. And see in Jesus uh, the only hope that you have for a Savior. If you will, then turn your life into His control, into His care. It simply uh, means to repent. To instead, being distracted by doing what you want to do, instead to choose from this day forward to live as Jesus would want you to do. Jesus said repentance is necessary in order for us to be pleasing to Him. Confess your faith in Christ. Your faith that Jesus is the Son of God. And then identify with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized so that, his sins, so that your sins might be washed away by the blood that He shed on your behalf. That's the message of the gospel. That's the plan whereby one can be saved. That's the means whereby one is transferred out of this world and its distractions into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Many of us have done that. But are we living lives free of distraction? Oh, there are so many things competing for time and for our attention and for our focus. It's so easy to get caught up in the hustle bustle, is it not? I know it firsthand. It's a struggle for me every day, I assure you. But keep your focus on Jesus. Don't let the devil distract you. He's determined to do that. Keep looking to Jesus. And if as a Christian you know, you realize I've been distracted. I've let other things take precedent, become more important in my life than him, then repent and pray. Know your enemy, the devil. He's always trying to destroy. But Jesus is greater and the victory is his. And through him we can share that same. If we can help you in doing that this morning, make those needs known to us. And please come while we stand, while we sing together.